I'd like to welcome all of our attendees today to our Zoom briefing. My name is Tom Giovanetti. I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation. We are a 34 year old free market think tank based in Dallas, Texas. I'd like to welcome you all to our Zoom briefing today entitled Antitrust and the Modern Economy. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you being with us. Uh, antitrust is not the sexiest possible topic that we could be doing a Zoom event on. During the pandemic, we've done about 35 of these Zoom briefings. Uh, and this is the first one we've done on antitrust, but it is very relevant today to the policy discussion going on in Washington, D.C. And so we're delighted to be doing this. I want to especially thank uh, those of you out there who are IPI supporters and donors. Thank you so much for your support. Uh, your support makes it possible for us to do events like this and briefings like this. Uh, and if after this event, you're impressed enough that you'd like to know more about how you can get involved with IPI, uh, we would love that. And I would suggest that you contact Addie Crimmins. Addie Crimmins is our director of events and development here at IPI. Her email address is on all the emails you've received related to this event. And so she would be a great person for you to contact if you want to get to know more about IPI or find out how you can be involved in becoming a supporter. Uh, today's event is, monitor, is, is moderated by Bartlett Clellan. Bartlett is a research fellow here at IPI and has had an association with IPI for several decades. Uh, Bartlett, I'm sorry, that sort of ages both of us, but uh, our, our, association, our association with you spans decades at this point. Uh, we're very pleased that Bartlett is with us today. We appreciate him taking the time to put this event together and to uh, invite the panelists and all of that. And so, Bartlett, I will turn things over to you at this point, and uh, I will I will remain absent from the program until it's time for Q&A. But at this point, I'll turn things over to Bartlett. Bartlett, thank you very much for all of your efforts here, and thank you for putting this together. Well, I was going to say thank you, Tom, but I'm not sure after being called out for being old and crotchety that I, hmm. I should. So, But uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Tom, and welcome everyone, and thank you, IPI, for hosting this panel today. Um, I've got to say to the panelists, uh, I say this often because it is almost universally true, I love doing these panels because I get to get together with some old friends and uh, riff on some policy topics, two of my very favorite things to do. And uh, increasingly, as I do these Zooms, I remember uh, how much better it is when we get to sit around a table somewhere and do this in person. So. Um, I owe you all a drink at some future conference somewhere where we will do that. And anyone here listening, you're welcome to join and you'll get the same treat that you heard before we started recording. And if you didn't get here for the opening, uh, the opening piece uh, where we were just kind of riffing, you probably missed the best part of the, the whole day uh, because we have a lot of fun uh, teasing each other. We've known each other for a long time. All right. With that. Uh, let's get to our panel uh, today, joining us to discuss antitrust in the modern economy. Uh, we're going to have time later for your questions, as you heard. So be thinking about those, get them prepared, put them into the function. I promise I will try to get through as many as possible. Uh, we're going to have some uh, kind of roundtable conversation first. Um, I will urge all the panelists to be as pithy, but as complete as uh, possible, because we would like to get some questions. And if we don't get any, we will all uh, continue to uh, chit chat amongst ourselves on these topics because I know we could go for, for days, much to the delight of the entire audience. <laughs> all right, let me introduce everyone. So let me introduce first Jessica, Jessica Malusian, who we just found out has a uh, long lost brother in Southern California who appears on, uh, was that Fox News, uh, CNN, something. Uh, that's great, it's great, glad to hear it. Uh, she is the director for the Center for Technology and Innovation at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, or as a lot of you probably know, CEI. Her research focuses on technology issues that includes antitrust, topic for today, online privacy, internet tax, telecommunications, social media content, and net neutrality regulations. Um, I would go through her list of where uh, her op-eds have appeared. It is uh, voluminous, so let's just say she's extremely well published. Uh, but she might also appear familiar to you, um, and if not, she should, because she has appeared on Fox News, C-SPAN's Washington Journal, CNBC's Power Lunch, and Varney and Company on Fox Business Network. Her voice might also ring a bell. She's been featured on NPR's Marketplace, The David Webb Show on Sirius XM, and regularly interviewed on any number of what we now dear, dearly call terrestrial radio programs. She graduated magna cum laude from Claremont McKenna College with a degree in government and art history. 
Uh, one of my favorite things about her is she has a degree in art history. I love, <laughs> I love the variety. Her honors thesis, very relevant to today, uh, explored the development of American antitrust law, but particularly then as it pertained to the Microsoft trial. Next up is Carl Zabo. Carl, another old friend of mine, um, is vice president and general counsel for NetChoice and is an adjunct professor at the George Mason Antonin Scalia School of Law. He is well known in the policy space uh, to many, many folks. He works to keep the internet safe for free expression and thankfully for free enterprise. Thank you for those efforts, Carl. And finally, but not nearly least, Christopher Koopman. Chris is, uh, has become a great friend and someone I respect a great deal and runs a great program out in Utah. He's the executive director at the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. He specializes in regulation, competition, and innovation. His research and commentary, also widely known, has appeared in Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Bloomberg, and NPR. He is also a contributor for The Hill and I find wonderful was named uh, to Forbes 30 under 30 in 2016 for wow. law and policy. Prior to joining CGO, he was a senior research fellow and director of technology policy program at the Mercatus Center, also at George Mason University. He is currently a senior affiliate scholar with the Mercatus Center and a member of the IT and Emerging Technology Working Group at the Federalist Society Regulatory Transparency Project. Yes, so we have three lawyers here today. Um, so thankfully we have Jessica to help balance us out and keep us honest, uh, and probably knows more than the three of us put together. So with that, <clears throat> let's get rolling on the, uh, issues and you're going to, uh, everyone, um, will get to hear some opening comments from them. So you guys get ready for that. But for the first time in decades, the consumer welfare standard for antitrust scrutiny is being seriously challenged by forces on both sides of the political spectrum, something that's a little different than what we've seen in the past. On the left, the Biden administration has appointed, uh, frankly, unapologetic advocates of aggressive antitrust intervention to head very key agencies. But yet on the right, populists have suddenly embraced federal government power as a tool to satisfy their frustrations, which what many of them refer to erroneously and ridiculously as, quote, big tech. Uh, but is antitrust really appropriate for innovative industries at all? What are the politicians actually trying to accomplish with threatening antitrust investigations, much less breakups? Um, and even if government, uh, should government even have such power to break up large companies? If they do, is there a limiting principle or should there be? Can't wait to hear what this panel has to say, all experts in this area. Folks, if I could get a pithy, pithy, two minutes from each of you um, to kick off uh, an overview of where we're headed, that would be great. Um, and because, frankly, Jessica has the coolest background of all of us and most professorial. Jessica, let's go to you. Uh, the, the irony. Um, thanks, <laughs> and thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be with all of you today. Um, I guess I'm just going to, because I'm going first, I'll set the scene a little bit um, because we never want, uh, it's very important to me when I do these to actually uh, have people watching come away with more information <laughs> than they entered. And, and sometimes because we do this all day, all the time, um, we don't kind of give you the lay of the land. Um, so I'll, I'll take the hit for the group on that. Um, and I trust it's all the rage. It's all the rage in Congress. It's all the rage at the agencies. Uh, it's all the rage in the states. And there's also what I call tech on tech violence, uh, which is private suits being filed to one tech company to the other um, to try to push those limits. So um, what you have is kind of two prongs, I think is, is the 30,000 foot view of it. One is we want more there's groups that want more enforcement of the antitrust laws as they're already um, interpreted and, and are on the books. And then there's uh, very loud voices, uh, especially at the FTC right now, who would like an expansion of those antitrust laws. So that's that's sort of what's happening. It's happening on a lot of fun fronts. It's happening in a lot of industries that would be affected by all those changes. But um, I think most uh, advertised is the, is the tech firms. Um, so we can talk a little bit as we go through about the history of antitrust, what changes have happened, what changes are being pushed for by some of these um, groups, mostly on the left, but also strangely from um, the populist street of the right. So there's a political element here that I think we will probably move on to consider. And then I guess that as we're talking about this, I would just challenge everyone who maybe is a little bit new to this or isn't quite sure 
what their opinion on this is, to, to ask themselves to be really, <laughs> hold themselves to the standard of, if, if the tech companies and their size or their actions are something that you do find concerning, I would challenge you to ask yourself if what you're concerned about are really the issues that are covered by antitrust. So I've had so many conversations with people who perhaps are you know, traditionally kind of conservative or limited government, um, kind of anti-regulation. And they say, but you know, I really, I, there's something about these companies that really does make me nervous. And when you start talking through to people, it's amazing how often what they're really concerned about is how Amazon works the tax code or labor concerns or, um, you know, content speech decisions that people have concerns with and don't agree with. So I would just, as all of us speak, um, and ha are, are benefited by Carl and Chris's insights. Uh, I would just challenge everyone to ask yourself, you know, are these competition issues or are these something else? And, and it's not to say is that valid or not, if it's something else, but that is certainly should be called out as a separate conversation that, you know, we, we can have as a society as well. Um, but ask yourself if this is really something that's about hurting consumers. Is it about increases in price? Is it about a lack of innovation? Is it about markets that aren't competitive and we don't see new entrants and we don't see changes in progress? And if it's not that, then you're not worried about antitrust. And, and we can talk about the other things you might be worried about. Uh, but I, I, I think that's a really useful way of coming into this conversation and framing it for yourself. So um, you, you come away brighter and better than you entered. I, I don't know if that was two minutes, but. I hope it wasn't too much. It was it was close enough. And, and sans legal jargon, which is uh, my best way to have this conversation. Thank you, Jessica. Chris, <laughs> Chris let's let's go to you. Uh, same two minute pithy approach to get us started here. Yeah, I'll, I'll make I'll make two points, uh, make them quick. And uh, maybe I'll just repeat some of what Jessica said, just in a slightly different way. But I think it's worth repeating. I think the first thing we, we need to start with in any conversation about law enforcement. And that's really what antitrust is. is this law, it's enforcing antitrust laws. What is the point of the law? The, the point of the law is twofold, to promote vigorous competition and to protect consumers. That's the point of antitrust law in America. And, and to your question about should we, um, should we think of um, antitrust law as an appropriate remedy in innovative industries, I think the question you have to ask yourself is, is the industry competitive is, or in, are consumers protected would they be made better off or worse off by antitrust intervention? I think it's pretty clear in most of these conversations that it has very little to do with the competition in, in, uh, in that particular industry. It has very little to do with whether or not consumers are made better off or worse off. It has some other, um, some other agenda, as, as Jessica said. And I, I, I think to put a finer point on, and this is my second point, is this is really just a, a big exercise in what, uh, in what folks have known for a long time as jawboning. Uh, we, we've seen this at the FCC for decades. As a colleague of mine um, at the Mercatus Center and I have written on this a, a number of times, but the way that the FCC has used its merger review uh, to achieve some other aspect, some other policy agenda that it can achieve otherwise, and it's going to use its merger review authority to do so. You think, you know, um, infringing on companies' First Amendment rights, saying we won't allow company A to merge with company B unless they create some programming or they refuse to, to carry some, some programming that they find offensive or, or what have you. We've known this for, for some time at the FCC and people at the Federal Communications Commission. We've known this for some time, that this is the way that their, their, their merger review authority works. And I think you're seeing the same thing now percolating at the FTC in particular, is there some other policy agenda that policymakers want to achieve, be it you know content moderation debates or you know, otherwise business practices that are totally innocuous and make consumers um, vastly better off, but for some reason are seen as troublesome uh, or, or problematic by policymakers. And so they're going to threaten uh, a breakup or they're going to threaten an ex post merger review, or they're going to make a company disgorge a merger that maybe is a decade old in the name of achieving some other uh, policy uh, agenda, and I, I think again, that's that's really the problem we have here is we've we've found an effective tool to scare folks, and we'll I think we'll talk about this when we talk about the economics of, of antitrust to scare folks, businesses, and entrepreneurs into doing something else, and it's just sort of the sort of Damocles hanging over uh, a vast swath of our economy, 
uh, threatening anyone at any point in time with, you know, essentially the strongest power that the federal government has in the private market, and that's to break up and destroy company and the accumulation of wealth. Two extra points for referencing sort of Damocles. Thank you, Chris. Uh, same two minutes to you, Carl. <laughs> no, thanks. Uh, and thanks again for having me here. One of the things that President Obama was famous for saying is when he couldn't control Congress, he said, I have a pen and a phone. And so rather than actually do something through a legislative approach, he would just circumvent them by writing executive orders that he basically knew were at the time unconstitutional. It's kind of an end run around the legislative process. And I think what the point that Chris was picking up on is that's what we're seeing with antitrust law. There are a lot of very progressive ideas out there that they know would never be approved by Congress, that the American people would never themselves actually want. But instead of actually doing the proper steps and going through the legislative process, having votes, you know, the real hard work, or even doing a rulemaking, they can just come out and say antitrust and then through either express or implied, which is what Chris was hitting on, express, I'm actually breaking you up or implied I'm going to break you up if you don't do things the way I want they're able to leverage antitrust law for political gains. I think before we get too deep into the conversation though, it's important to level set, what is antitrust law about? And it's often said that it's about breaking up monopolies. These companies are monopolies, therefore they must be broken up under antitrust law. And that's, that's just false. It, uh, as an attorney, it makes my head kind of want to explode. Uh, Antonin Scalia said in the Trinco decision, he's like, uh, under, essentially, under American antitrust law, if you win, if you are the best person out there, if you make the best mousetrap, if you're the best fighter, if you're the best basketball player, great. You should enjoy the fruits of those labors. Just because you're really tall, and that's unfair to somebody who's short like me, that doesn't mean you have to play basketball on your knees. But that's kind of what we're seeing with this approach to antitrust law. Because you have been successful, because you innovated, because you improved, because you have achieved what we want everyone to achieve in America, we must destroy you because now your success is too much. And, you know, essentially success is shameful. It's like that old adage, in America, anyone can make it. And now it's becoming, in America, can make it so long as they don't make too much. And this is kind of the attitude we're seeing to misuse antitrust law to just destroy you because you're successful. What does antitrust law do then instead? And this is the way it's been for the past 40 plus years, supported by every single Supreme Court justice. So this is when people come out and say the court's divided, they are completely aligned on this. You got Scalia and Ginsburg, you got Berger and uh, uh, every other one agreeing that consumer welfare standard is the right approach. And basically what does it do? It forces the prosecution to prove Three things. One, that you have what's called market power, that you basically can make changes and adjust the market. Two, that you are abusing that market power. And three, that abuse harms consumers. And when Jessica started, she listed out a whole bunch of people complaining about antitrust law. She said politicians, federal, state. The one thing that's often missing from these descriptions are American people. You can walk up and down Main Street today and you ask them, what are your top five concerns for what's going on in America? I would give you a dollar for every time they said antitrust. And I predict you would be unable to even buy a cup of coffee. And that's because for Americans, everything's amazing. Because of the robust com convenience, because of the convenience created by the, since we're talking about quote unquote big tech, the internet. Bartlett was complaining earlier that he couldn't ever figure out what the final book in a multi-book series of the Wheel of Time is. Spoiler alert, there is no final book, but he was able to go to services like Amazon and Barnes and Noble and others online and figure that out. Uh, the convenience is amazing. For me as a parent, when we're running out of stuff at home, I click a button and Costco is delivering it to my door. Nobody is complaining about antitrust. No American citizen is complaining that everything is too convenient, too low price and too available. And what you're seeing in Congress is just an effort to advance progressive politics under the auspices of antitrust law. Thank you, Carl. Um, so Carl kind of got to this, uh, Jessica, a little bit, but I, I wanna underscore, I'd like you to uh, make it lead in what we're talking about here. 
Well, our, our goal is never to educate the antitrust bar. That's not who IPI talks to. That's not who's here. So um, talking to the, the people on the street, just like what Carl was saying, what, could you give us a working definition of antitrust? It's kind of a weird word. Um, it doesn't really work anywhere else other than in this setting, this legal setting. And uh, give us some of the history of its purpose and, and goals. So I think that um, especially where I work at CI, the main thrust of our work is anti-regulatory. Um, so we naturally sort of just like antitrust laws are regulatory laws, right? It's a specific kind of regulation, but they're, they're regulations. And I think that there's um, an impulse for people who don't spend too much time on this to think that they're kind of like these special magical <laughs> regulations and uh, because they have the good intention of preserving competition, they're not like other regulations that might suffer from harmful unintended consequences and political capture and all these other things that we kind of, at least many of us on the right, understand uh, intuitively about uh, regulatory institutions. So I, I, first I wanna say antitrust is regulation. That being said, wh what kind of regulation is it? Well just like these fine gentlemen have explained, uh, it's about, you know, looking for a competitive market. Uh, is there a monopoly power? Have you abused that power? And in that abuse, have you hurt consumers? So uh, again, very popular for politicians to talk about antitrust right now, very popular for competitors of successful firms to talk about antitrust right now. But um, I don't think there's any greater illustration of what consumers experiences have been with these tech companies than when we were all locked in our homes for a year or so. Um, if you try to picture what we all went through uh, without some of these big firms, it, it just could have been so much worse for everyone. I mean, so many small businesses survived because of their Facebook page that they were able to say, oh, now we're doing curbside takeout and here's our new hours. And, you know, um, and how did all these delivery people use their Google Maps to get to your house? I mean, we go and uh, the entertainment that was facilitated. Um, and you also saw, by the way, about that market, that this is not a market that's static, right? You wouldn't have seen the explosive success of a before unheard of company, Zoom, if, if this was like a, a static area where there was no innovation and no growth, you just wouldn't have seen that. So I think that um, if, you, if you look at consumers' real life experiences, I think that tells you a lot probably about their level of concern on this versus some of the like political scare taxes that you hear coming out of Washington and you hear coming out of state AG offices um, that you know I think ultimately they're looking for clicks and donations and interest. Um, but I'm not sure that the real life experience of consumers matches up very well with making this like a top priority. So very briefly, the history of antitrust. So you'll see a correlation anytime this, the, the tide of populism rises in the US like we are in now, you see antitrust conveniently, not coincidentally, uh, come back up in popularity. That's sort of how it started when firms began to get very, very large. Um, that made people nervous and uh, it makes politicians really nervous because they like to be the biggest kid on the block, the biggest bully. And um, I, I think that there's something inherent in that um, that I always tell people who are worried about how big these tech firms are outside. Well, don't worry because they're still not as big as the US military industrial complex. Like if you want to worry about something, you can still worry about the government coming and seizing your property and putting you in jail, which is something that even um, Jeff Bezos cannot do. So uh, you see the rise of that when antitrust law first comes up and it's a mess for a long time, like for decades, it's a mess. And, the, and it's su such a vague statute, the Sherman Act, that the courts kind of decide, I guess we're gonna have to figure out what this means. And what you see is a lot of problems. I mean, I always say you can't really serve two masters and that's what antitrust was trying to do for a while. You can't protect smaller competitors and protect consumers because a, a simple illustration of this is if you uh, you know lit into an uh, industry leader because your prices are just so low, your poor competitors can't compete. Well, if you artificially inflate those prices, who gets hurt? Consumers, right? You're benefiting that firm, but you're not serving consumers. So at some point, um, 
the great late Bork came along and said, someone's got to figure this out and maybe some economics would be helpful. And, you know, he sat down and said, you know, the real point of this should be consumers because everything else can get politicized and, and abused. And um, just the threat of that, right, is this chilling effect on innovation and progress. And if you're a business person and you're afraid that 10 years later, your acquisition is going to be overturned, or perhaps your great new partnership Recently, there's a JetBlue American Airlines partnership where they're trying to increase some efficiency by being able to compete on the East Coast. And now they're they're being attacked because they're colluding. So if you're worried that your new innovative business practice is going to get you in trouble with law enforcement, that's going to prevent you from trying new innovative ideas. That's sort of how we see uh, the wrong kind of antitrust actually create the problem that it's purporting to solve, right? It's, it's saying I'm, we're protecting innovation, but in fact, it chills it. So um, Judge Bork was kind enough to sort all of that out for us. It's certainly been a huge improvement. Uh, and now we find ourselves back with another sort of rise in the populist tide. You know, from the left, this is understandable that they're pro-antitrust enforcement because they're pro-regulation, right? They're pro-government and you, you might not agree with it, but you understand it. But from the right, it's interesting to see the populist streak say that um, they don't like the bigness in, in corporate America either, uh, even though I think that's an important distinction to make between corporate bigness and government bigness, but they do not agree. So be it. Uh, so right now what you have is this sort of revival of the old antitrust that we thought we had already sorted out and a big push to expand the definition of what antitrust can do, its goals, these very broad goals of social justice and equity and uh, demo preserving democracy uh, that seem a little um, ambitious to me for regulatory agencies, just based on all evidence to the contrary. Uh, but that's sort of the history. It started as a bit of a mess. We've gotten it cleaned up and now uh, the mess has come knocking again. And that, that's sort of where we are at today. So many follow-up questions I'd love to do, not least of which it sounds like a convenient excuse, but I'll leave those for, for discussion from the audience. Um, so, okay, another important factor here, Carl, uh, for you, because I know you guys have uh, done some work in Europe on a couple of different topics. Um, we hear in this debate about, some, in fact, we've mentioned it here, something called competition policy that sounds strangely like, but not necessarily exactly like what we call antitrust, has a better name. Uh, antitrust regular or competitive competition regulation sounds uh, somehow makes more sense than antitrust as a regulation. What is the EU approach as compared to the United States when it comes to quote competition policy or antitrust? And then what is uh, different? And somewhere in there, um, let's make sure to explain the consumer welfare standard. And if you can do all that in about literally three minutes, that would be awesome. Okay, let's go. Uh, so <laughs> Let's start off with the, the notion of what is the approach in Europe. The approach in Europe is essentially kind of like the same approach we have with indecency or obscenity. I know when I see it. So this is actually where the United States used to be back in the 1900s. This, this is the antitrust enforcement we started with. Uh, Europe actually didn't start doing antitrust enforcement until well after the United States. So if you look at stages of evolution, Europe's actually well behind the United States in the evolution of antitrust law. We started back in the day with what's called, I know, I know when I see it, the government looks at you, decides you're too big and we will break you up. They don't necessarily rely on economics or harm to consumers. They instead say, well, you're too big. And as Jessica pointed out, your prices are too low. Therefore, competitors can't compete and we are going to break you up. Now, if you are artificially keeping those prices low so that you actually lose money to kill competition, that's illegal. We're just talking about low, low prices in general. So think about a situation where a supermarket comes into town. They are now selling corn at a dollar. The, the old supermarket sold it at a 150. The government would say, well, that's unfair. You can't sell it at a dollar. We're going we're gonna to tell you, you, you uh, have to break up. Any efficiencies you have are therefore illegal. It is subject to such abuse and crony, uh, crony capitalism that we as a country in the 70s and 80s evolved. We turned away from this object, subjective standard of, I know when I see it, 
and evolved into what's called the consumer welfare standard, which is basically saying, let's use economics, let's use numbers, let's use data. So it's not in the eye of the beholder, it's not in the eye of a political appointee, it's not in the eye of whoever is able to have the best lobbying team. We will actually use actual data to back up assertions of antitrust violations. And at the end of the day, what is our purpose? Our purpose is to protect the consumer. Businesses will always compete. There will always be a slightly larger business that can do things better, faster, stronger, and tearing them down just because they can do it better, stronger, faster is not a good basis. So Europe is very exciting to a lot of people. It's kind of like uh, a teenager in a car. And maybe I'm saying this because I'm old, but when I was a kid, you drive fast. You don't wear your seatbelt. You are flipping the bird to the police as you speed by 100 miles per hour. I never did that. But it's very attractive. You look, oh, what a cool guy that is doing all these amazing things. What a cool country. What a cool set of nations. And that's what Europe is basically doing. They're driving fast. They're driving recklessly, but they are unsafe at any speed. Instead, the United States is kind of the older, more mature, elder statesman who, as you get older, say, maybe we should slow down. Maybe we should use our turn signals. Maybe we should actually get data and figure out a better way to do this that will get us to our final destination in a safe way that doesn't endanger lives, that doesn't endanger other businesses. And I think this is exactly why when we talk about innovation and if antitrust law is supposed to drive innovation and you look at Europe and you say there is none or little to none and nobody's saying, talking about all the innovations coming out of Europe, then their aggressive antitrust actions don't marry with innovation. You should see a one-to-one -one correlation as antitrust enforcement goes up, innovation goes up, and that's not what you see in Europe. So clearly the Europe system is broken. I am hoping that they do become a bit more evolved when it comes to antitrust law. And people need to recognize that following the European model is us going backwards when we should all be moving forwards towards something that actually improves innovation and consumers' lives. Oh. And Barley, you're muted. And while you're muted, if you want to learn more about consumer welfare standard, <laughs> you can buy the antitrust paradox at Barnes and Noble and Amazon and many other book stores. Just not brick and mortar. At least that's the information I have in my uh, sidebar chat. All right, uh, Chris. So we've got the domestic piece in the history. We've got the international piece. So one piece we haven't talked about uh, robustly yet is kind of law and policy, uh, antitrust law and policy meets economics. And I know you spend a lot of time in that area. And it's one of the reasons I love the work that you guys do at CGO. Give us a sense of what all this means, what Jessica was talking about, what Carl has mentioned, as we move beyond just the, the terse legal world into the bigger economic issues at play. Yeah, and I, I do want to just really highlight a point here in, in, in the economics of, um, you know, you could call it industrial organization or um, just, you know, antitrust, what, whatever you want to call it. And, and it, is big necessarily bad? There is no economic model that, that, that would suggest that the size of the firm is directly coordinate, correlated with a lack of competition in that industry. In fact, you would, a lot of the models suggest that market concentration and competition are correlated together, that in many ways, highly competitive or highly concentrated markets also tend to be the result of high competition. That's because as you know, as products are, are, are more easily substituted, the profit margins are reduced and therefore fewer firms can exist in that, in that market. So in many ways, uh, you know, concentration is the result of consumers winning in this game, not losing. Um, and there are some instances in which there, the, the size of firms and the concentration in an industry may be a signal of a lack of competition but you can't just look at a firm, its size and the concentration that is the number of firms in that industry and say if that's good or bad on its face. You just can't do it. The economics just does not suggest that you can make that call. In fact, as I said, you know, in, in, in many instances, um, you know, there, 
there's it's evidence to suggest the opposite, right? That concentration is the result of, of competition and you have highly competitive duopolies, right? We could probably, I, we, I won't belabor this um, a, anymore, but you could point out a, a number of industries in which you have two firms and no one is complaining. Absolutely no one is complaining. So to suggest that because tech is big or because there's only three social media platforms that people like to use um, or whatever, they, none of that suggests that there's a lack of competition, right? All of that is just, they're, they're facts that need to be analyzed on their own. So to say, you know, Amazon is big, therefore Amazon is bad is wrong, right? Or Amazon has a lot of things. They're, they're um, you know, they're a, uh, you know, no one is saying break up PNG, Procter and Gamble, right? No one, no one is saying the fact that Procter and Gamble sells you both cereal and laundry detergent is a problem. No one is saying that. No one says because General Electric sells you, um, you, you know, microwaves, light bulbs, and in military jets that somehow it's a bad company, right? Because we we don't think about that in those ways. Right. It's somehow in, in tech in innovation, it's it's become this trope that few fewer competitors is bad. Uh, fewer competitors means less competition and fewer competitors mean consumers are worse off. That's that's not that's not true. Right. And the second thing we just need to think about, and, and this is, you know, we, we have to be very careful about the incentives that we're setting. Right. Like the ex post enforcement actions are ex ante incentives for the next generation of entrepreneurs and innovators. Right. There's a reason why. Um, no, I mean, I'm sure maybe someone on the call can do it, but I, I bet you can't pick two. Name me two major European tech companies. Can't do it. Right. Like you could look at a map. Right. And you can see all of the major innovation and all of the growth in the tech sector is happening in the United States and has traditionally happened in the United States over the last 30 years for a reason. And that's because we built an open infrastructure around the growth and innovation in these industries that if we were to adopt the European approach of strong antitrust enforcement of sort of like blind uh, application of antitrust laws with no connection to the economics, that what you're telling innovators is go away. Right. Like we just have to remember this. Like this is there are there are generations that will come after us that will be impacted for a long time as a result of the 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 political wins that we may think we're getting today. Um, those are the, the, the major pieces. The other thing I would I, I would just add to this um, is, you know, when measuring cons like consumer satisfaction with tech companies in particular, we've got we've got you know, multiple, we're now in year two of our polling that we've been doing at the Center for Growth and Opportunity, where we're, we're actually asking consumers things like, what companies do you like? Who do you trust? Would your life be better off or worse off if company A or company B or company C were broken up? Like, would you be better off if, if these companies were broken up? And one thing that we've, we've found consistently over this is that folks who follow the political news more closely and people who uh, identify in uh, in partisan groups, be them political parties or political ideologies, are more likely to have a negative view of these companies and more likely to have a positive view on their future if these companies were broken up. If you just measure these companies, your satisfaction with these companies on the merits of the products that they're creating that you are using, you find people are like, no, I would not be better off if these companies were broken up, right? Like, good, like no, no one uh, tends to say that... Um, Google, uh, my life would be better if Google were broken up, um, but for those people who follow the political news closely. So in some ways, in the way we've been talking about this is the, you know, the, the, the view of antitrust and tech and the fact that tech needs to be fixed with antitrust is a beltway problem built by beltway people for beltway people. You go out into the rest of the country Right, come out here to Northern Utah and ask people, do you like Google? And they're like, yeah, how else do I find things? Right, like they're not like, I love Google, but it would be way better off if they were destroyed. Right, take that product away from me because by golly, I don't like their politics. Right, most people don't interact with the companies that they do business with in that, in that way. And we just have to remember this as these headlines are dominating the narrative that for the most part, when it comes to the economy outside of Washington, D.C., or even state capitals, most people are not viewing um, 
the the interaction of you know antitrust and tech in a favorable light. Most of them aren't even thinking about it at all because they like the products they have. Though it occurs to me, having talked to each of you about these pieces, we could literally have an entire discussion on any one of these pieces. So I have so many questions. I have to leave it there because I want to get through this next section in literally about 12 minutes. So we have plenty of time for a few questions. And by the way, we have two great questions in the queue. Thank you for the folks who put those in there. I'm going to have to reduce them a little bit uh, to get the questions out, but they're really good. I definitely want to get to them. So uh, everyone's on the same page. We're kind of current on where the debates are. So Carl, let me come back to you for a minute. Um, I want to go very specific, and Chris kind of teed this up. Um, I want to go specifically uh, to what's going on in this space as related to the technology industry. We heard about other industries that might be at play for various things. Let's go specifically to tech. Um, and why does it have the attention of fans of government? Uh, a lot of the, the folks who seem to cheer government uh, for whatever reason, uh, really seem to want them to have greater control of the industry that you represent. Um, any insights there? And uh, let's see, four minutes, and because then I'm going to give four minutes to Jessica and four minutes to Chris. It, yeah, it, it, it's multifaceted uh, rationale for this. So one is, as Chris alluded to, it's a Beltway problem created by Beltway people. And one of the things within that is you have a lot of corporate competitors of Amazon, of Facebook, of Google, of um, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and well, to, uh, uh, Apple, sorry, is, is the fourth. Amazingly, uh, Microsoft is left out of that equation because they are, they're one of the aggressors. And what you're seeing is a lot of FUD being thrown around in DC, a lot of energy, a lot of lobbying, Oh, fear, uncertainty, and debt. Okay, go yes. ahead. Uh, uh, when it, that, that's at least a common acronym that I throw. But a lot of funding that's going on in DC and a lot of lobbying going on to target four particular businesses because of their success. And rather than competing on the merits, rather than creating a better mousetrap, corporate competitors have decided instead we are going to go Tanya Harding and, and just kneecap competition. And for those of you who weren't born in America, there's a movie about that called I, Tanya. That's, all, that's one of the factors. Another is coming from what's basically legacy media. Historically, everyone would go to the Washington Post, the New York Times, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News for their news. But now we have other news sources. And what does that mean? That means the legacy news industry is losing eyeballs and influence. And just like the other corporate competitors, whether they're Oracle or Microsoft or someone in the tech sector, the news media industry is very angry and they're trying to help rile up this antitrust fervor. On top of that, they have their own financial incentive. Anytime you put a well-known company on the front page, it sells papers. If you see a story about something you use every single day, you're going to click on it. Uh, one of the examples that came up, Procter & Gamble. If somebody had a story about Procter & Gamble is a big threat, most people would say, who is Procter & Gamble? Uh, as opposed to every day, people know what Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Apple are. So you've got that factor included in it. And then when it comes to the conservative side of the aisle in particular, a lot of this comes to just a frustration with treatment of conservatives on tech platforms. There, and, and it's ironic because back in 2016, you heard Democrats complaining about platforms because basically that was the only way President Trump could have been elected according to them. And then come closer to 2018, 2020, conservatives start complaining as content moderation policies go higher. And their anger at tech has now resulted in kind of this ability to askew and throw away conservative principles of limited government and free markets to say, you know what, Twitter, I don't like you. We need to punish tech. And you're seeing efforts to put all of tech in a boat and then turning it over to the FTC and Lena Khan and the Biden administration, basically saying, sink this boat. So that's what it is. It's almost like a perfect storm of people who compete with tech, people who are angry with tech for content moderation, and then they see this bright, shiny tool of antitrust and say, you know, if we start swinging this club, we're going to really strike you down. 
And at the end of the day, what are they going to do? They're just going to decimate the foundations on which much of our economy is built. And most of the conveniences that everyday constituents and consumers use. So I think that's kind of where it all gets wrapped together. So perfect lead in uh, for my question over to you, Jessica, staying on the, in the tech industry focus for a moment. So what would it mean? And you, you alluded to this. You didn't use these words, I don't think, but you alluded to this neo Brandeisian hipster antitrust. Uh, should we call it a movement? Um, I don't know what to call it. Um, uh, this mess. Um, what would it mean for the tech industry if their approach were to gain traction? Okay, so let's talk about like some very real world consequences here if you employ um, kind of this souped up on steroids antitrust. Um, I, I like to just kind of walk through what the consequences would be. So one thing that um, the government wants right now or, or some people in the government want right now is to break up Facebook in terms of um, divesting them of their acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp. So if you talk to people about what they're mad about with social media, um, it's content moderation. And I like to ask people, why do you think that a separate Instagram would act any differently uh, than when it's owned by Facebook? You don't like these rules, I understand that, but um, hacking them up into less efficient, uh, less well-running do doesn't solve your problem. So I, I think there's just, like Carl was saying, a certain amount of frustration and anger um, about what's perceived as bias against them. Um, and they just wanna punish them and, and they just wanna hurt them. Uh, but I don't think that this is really the solution they're seeking with the speech concerns. But what I can tell you it will do, uh, if you start uh, robbing companies <laughs> of other smaller companies they purchased, is it's gonna give a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of funders in Silicon Valley pause, right? So we, uh, on a separate depressing, bandwidth have uh, really ramped up financial regulations, Sarbanes-Oxley. And it's much more expensive and much more complicated to take your company uh, to an IPO to go public. So what does that mean? Well, you're not going to get rich with your IPO of this company you started or funded. So what's another path? Well, maybe some rich company will acquire you. That would be amazing. You will be rich. You will have all this money to take back and make the next company and the next company. And that's what Silicon Valley does. It churns out new ideas, new apps, new services. Um, and that's what we all benefit from. But if another path to success gets blocked, meaning the IPO is now harder, and now acquisitions are a little bit questionable, right? We don't know really what the rule is about when we're gonna run afoul of that. So those big companies that have been acquiring will be a little more hesitant to acquire you. It'll be a little less likely that you get a big paycheck at the end of all of this risk and work. You're really, that's a chilling effect. And, and that kind of gets us back to what we see in Europe. And one of the many reasons why you don't see uh, the very positive churn of new companies, new services, new apps, new, approaches to tech coming out of places like Europe, like you do here, because incentives matter, right? If there's an incentive to get rich at the end of it. And in the meantime, if we all benefit from those ideas being put into practice as consumers, I personally, I'm, I'm pro that. Like you're allowed to get rich people who are smarter than I am. I'm all for it because I benefit from that. So uh, I, I think you have to look at Good intentions are not enough when it comes to the regulatory actions uh, of antitrust, right? I understand people are upset about speech stuff or worried about privacy or whatever your complaint is, but um, chilling innovation and killing the engine on this is, is not good for anyone. Uh, and I just don't think that the real world results are gonna be for consumers what people hope they are. And again, from the left, they just love this stuff. They love being in charge of the economy. They love regulations. I don't agree, but I get it. But I would just caution people who normally would be opposed to this sort of government intervention, um, who are more limited government inclined. I, I would just emphasize this is no different. It, the same principles apply, whether it's physical property uh, and oil companies or whether it's uh, digital property or the property is long and skinny in telecom or anything else, right? The, all the rules are the same. All the instincts you have to be wary of government intervention should prevail in this. Um, and I think Carl's kind of gone over why that's, that's a struggle right now for a certain segment of the population. But 
I think the consequences matter. And I, you know, I don't think this will be any good for consumers. I love you. Keep us grounded in the, in the uh, principle, Jessica. That's awesome. And thank you for reminding us of that. Chris, I want to come to you um, and maybe on, maybe this is a good segue from the principles. Uh, I'm not sure, but it certainly is on politics. So I wanted to get your take on this. Um, and Jessica did uh, lead us there. And that is with Democrats being in charge on Capitol Hill and the White House, they definitely get attention for their thinking and their approach on antitrust. But they're not the only folks in town. There are these uh, critters called Republicans. And they seem to be as excited as we mentioned a couple times here about using antitrust. And frankly, that's the undercurrent of Jessica's uh, concerns and warning there at the end. What is their rationale? What, what is driving their intent? Give me uh, three or four minutes, and then we're going to go to our couple questions that are queued up. Yeah, I'd, and, and I'd love to answer uh, Barry's question, and maybe I'll lead in right, in, right into this, Bartlett. But I, I do think the, the rationale um, around this mirrors a lot of what Jessica has already said. There are other concerns that many conservatives and Republicans have around these companies, and um, it's it's kind of like reaching in a in a toolbox in the dark. They're just grabbing the first thing that 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 they got their hands on, um, and and it's the it's antitrust, right? It seems like the easiest, most uh, convenient tool to advance st- uh, these these other considerations. And I this is not to discount the speech considerations that a lot of Republicans have uh, around these tech companies. I would note, however, that literally within the same week. You had, you know, there was a publication at one point called Think Progress. It's no longer around, um, but Think Progress and Breitbart at the same week both published articles. Think Progress saying that Facebook was catering to conservatives, and Breitbart saying Facebook was an incubator for far left li- liberal ideologies. Like you can't, like both sides are extremely concerned about what they see as the other side using the platform. I would say this, even with all of the speech issues that Republicans have around the content moderation policies of these companies. No greater tool has given voice to the outside perspective that is many conservative viewpoints than social media companies. Diamonds and Silk would not exist if it were not for Facebook. Now they got sideways with the company at some point, but you know, think of, of, of even for example, and it's hard to, to put his his politics in, in a box, but you know, many people these days are saying Joe Rogan is a conservative uh, entertainer. He would not exist in a universe in which, actually he had a radio show at one point, you know, and he was doing the, he would not exist, he would not have the platform he, he has today were it not for YouTube allowing him to, to use their platform. So I, I would say that, you know, the concerns around speech are valid, but we need to keep them in, in context now to, to, to the question. And, and I do think that this is a really, this is a really difficult question. You do have, and this is the concern that many conservatives and Republicans have, which it seems to be the blatant collusion of government, social media companies, tech companies together to engage in, in what they see as, as viewpoint discrimination. What is the tool to overcome something like that? Well, there are two things. One, it's, it's important to remember that you know, it wasn't just Parler and Amazon that got sideways with one another about content matter, moderation policies. Facebook and Apple have have gotten sideways with each other about these same things too. And on issues that I think conservatives would be cheering Apple, bullying Facebook to change its own policies. We would be cheering this on. Apple Apple believed that Facebook wasn't doing enough to 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 curtail human trafficking on its platform. And suggestions had been made from Apple to Facebook, you need to step up your human trafficking efforts on your platform. Apple believed that Facebook was not doing it as, 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 as um, vigorously as the company wanted. So they said, you know what, we're not going to host your app on our app store anymore. It turns out Facebook fixed the problem in, in a matter of weeks, right? So in some ways, the, this, the, the, the content moderation is running both ways and the, the threats of deplatforming have run in both directions to both discourage and encourage issues that you know, conservatives and Republicans may agree with. But the question is, is antitrust the right tool? I think when it comes to speech and speech regulation on these platforms, if there is in fact evidence of joint action, 
there, there's First Amendment jurisprudence here that would suggest that these companies are now acting as an agent of the government and the First Amendment applies. If the Surgeon General of the United States is calling Facebook and saying, take down this post, if, if Anthony Fauci is calling Mark Zuckerberg and saying, this is dangerous misinformation, you need to take it down. And Facebook is in fact acting upon, upon the request, acting at the behest of the government, there are you don't have to break Facebook up. There are other remedies to ensure that there isn't government sponsored viewpoint discrimination happening on these platforms. And there are plenty of other tools. I just think we haven't looked at the toolbox yet. We just grabbed antitrust and we said, here, here we go. And now we're whacking away. And it turns out there are much better tools to curtail, correct, and, and even encourage behaviors in these platforms that, 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 that align with the rule of law, that enhance uh, conservative perspectives of the role of government in the market and don't, you know, run the risk of, I mean, I'll ask this question and then I'll stop Bartlett because I went, ran way past my four minutes, but let's say we all agree that we need to break up these tech companies and we need to do it now. And so we tell Chairman Khan, break these companies up and we give her all of the, all, all of the resources and all of the, 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 the authority that she needs to go after these companies. And let's say it happens tomorrow. What does she do Friday? Does she just stop? Does she go home? Does she go on vacation? Odds are she doesn't. She continues down this path of big is bad because that's a prior that she has and she's continued to operate on her entire professional career. It just so happens that the focus of this has been on, on tech companies. So again, we just have to keep in mind, we're, we may be building a, a, a regulatory apparatus that will continue to burrow a hole right down the middle of the American economy before we even have a chance to ask if, if that's really what we want. We just have to recognize that you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter really who, who is running the FTC. Once we tell the FTC, go break up big companies, they're gonna go break up big companies. Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. And we just have to be very honest and serious with ourselves about as, as Republicans, conservatives, what have you, is that the future you want for the American economy? And I, again, I, I think the, the concerns that Republicans have in many instances on their face are valid, but there are responses to each of those concerns that don't involve breaking up companies specifically because of some peripheral policy uh, idea that you may or may not want to achieve. Thank you, Chris. And I'm, I want to do a couple of things. First, I want to share Barry's question. Uh, I want to read it so everyone knows um, what you were answering. Thank you for going ahead and answering it. And then number two, I want to, uh, a couple of comments to Chris here. Um, I've often referred to uh, antitrust as the mall, M-A-U-L, which is a large war hammer, a mall of the progressive movement uh, that is anti-market. And I think you're right. If you reach blindly into a toolbox, the first thing you generally are going to grab is that that gigantic thing. So to Barry's question, I would say it's a little bit um, like swatting a fly with a maul, a gigantic warhammer. It's uh, at best, it's overdone. Um, and I think that's important to note and essentially what you were uh, what you were saying, Chris. But let me read his question. So he says, the concern of many conservatives is the blatant collusion between government, social media companies, and tech companies like Amazon and Apple in quashing our views. They've gone as far as to block Parler's app on Apple and deplatform the app on AWS, killing not only Parler's competition for Facebook, but quashing conservative views from the marketplace. Why isn't antitrust an answer to this? And if it's not, what power... Uh, do conservative consumers have to combat the effort to silence us? And uh, Chris, uh, I'd like to your answer, and I'd say underscore at least part of it. The answer was that it turns out that facts actually matter um, as part of the answer to Barry. But uh, Carl and Jessica, let me give you an opportunity to jump in. And if I can at most get two minutes from each of you, because then we have another really good question that I want to get to before we run out of time. So one of the things that we've that I've heard a lot is the, this argument of collusion among tech companies. And one of the things that's ignored is current antitrust law. If there is collusion to stop competitors, antitrust law allows an enforcement action against that today. It's called Sherman Act Section 1, which is a multi-party action. So if you get a bunch of players 
who are all the principals together and they sit down in a room and said, okay, we're going to squash this competitor. You don't need a new law. Congress doesn't need to lift a finger. You could bring an act today under Sherman, the Sherman Act, Section 1. So to the extent, Bartlett, to the point that you raised, the facts exist that there was a coordinated conspiracy to take down Parler amongst these players, then that could be used today by any state AG, the Federal Trade Commission. We don't need new laws if we think that this collusion is happening to stop competition. The more likely scenario is that since most of these platforms policies are dictated in part by what their users want and what their advertisers want, they didn't want their advertisers taking flight when they're hosting exceptionally controversial content that uh, the advertisers don't want to have any connection with. So that's kind of my takeaway there. And it gets into the, yes, if you are gonna use tools, use them properly. Don't create new laws if you have the laws on the books to do what you need. And then the other thing is, if we're worried about collusion between the government and platforms, the answer is not giving government more power. Uh, it should probably be taking away power from the government. Very good. Well, and, and to that point, Carl, we know that if uh, it, the presumption in the previous question was that government was actually acting through these technology companies, and we also have an answer for that, and Chris uh, mentioned that as well, that's First Amendment, and they become actors of the government, and so the remedy already exists, so you're right. Um, Jessica, do you want anything else you want to throw in on that question? I'm going to be really fast because I think that Carl and Chris have done a great job covering a lot of the points I would make. At CEI, we often say to each other about the, as far as the, the Facebook um, vaccination stuff, we always say, don't be the government. It's one of our foundational rules. Uh, and once you start to be the government, then like they've said, um, there's some rules that are already in place that kick in. And I would just also like to say about the parlor deplatforming on Amazon. I think that there's a problem. Um, there is a content moderation problem in America. Uh, that's because content moderation is incredibly, almost impossible to do perfectly at scale. It's incredibly challenging. Um, anyone who's looked into the issue, one person's offensive thing is the other person's like God-given truth. It's very difficult. Um, and I, I am not in the business of denying that there are failures of these companies to moderate well. Uh, but I am also still very sure that the solutions to those problems will come from the marketplace, where the bigger the problem, the bigger incentive someone has to figure it out and solve it. And it will not come from a bunch of uh, politicians who probably don't know how to check their own email, let alone solve the billions of posts a second content moderation problem we face. So I would just ask conservatives politely to be a little bit patient with creative destruction, be a little bit uh, patient with a market response. Because for me, the, the biggest problem with antitrust is the innovation that it prevents. Right. If you get the government involved, you're stopping the market process of coming in and saying, oh, there's a problem. And what that means is there's a huge financial incentive for someone who solves it. I would like to take a little breath here and, and let's see if that happens. And I will just hint at one possibility, which is decentralized social media. I will not bore you with the blockchain science. But the bottom line is there's no corporation that owns the platform. It's not top down and the users themselves are in charge of the content moderation. I think this is a real possibility for the next generation, and I think this is a market solution to what I understand as a legitimate frustration that many people have on the left and the right, as we've heard. Uh, so that's sort of my, my response uh, to the deplatforming question. Same thought, Jessica. I knew you were a genius, and so, so glad that uh, you're on board the decentralized platform technology as well. Um, okay, uh, we clearly have an antitrust scholar. I can't give complete credit to somebody. It comes in as anonymous um, attendee, and I'm going to say this person does a great job uh, in the question of laying out the history of the Sherman Act. I'm going to skip over that just for purposes of brevity, but thank you so much for including that because it gives great context. Folks, I'm going to go to kind of the end of this, and we would like to get one or two of you to jump in. And if we can hurry through this, we can squeeze in this final one that I have in here. We'll try to do that. Here's the question, or here's the background. Today, what we used to call trust um, in, in 1890, today we call a cartel, and today cartel members routinely get put in jail. 
um, legal cases like Standard Oil and American Tobacco broke up cartels. Isn't it the case that antitrust laws today are stronger and not weaker in part because of that? And are any of the alleged monopolies today similar to these cartels from 1900? Anybody have a shot at that? So I'm going to go I'll, really fast and first and say no. <laughs> yeah, I can explain. No, they're not. You guys go. I, I was going to give a slightly longer answer to that because one of the one of the things that made Standard Oil so powerful and the railroads and similar is barriers to entry. Barriers to entry. You have to dig a lot of oil wells. You have to pan for gold. You have to build railroads. Today, the barriers to entry to get up and running on the internet are incredibly low. And we don't have to go that far to find an example when it comes to social media, but only to look at TikTok, which is now the most downloaded app on the planet, followed by Snapchat. Remember, if the underlying theory is as soon as Facebook came along, no one else could be bigger, nobody else could be better, no one else could compete, then Snapchat should have died in the cradle. But remember, before we had Facebook, we had Napster. Before we had Napster, we had MySpace. Before we had Google, we had Yahoo, which was declared the winner of the search wars. So the idea that these are like the cartels of old doesn't match the facts on the ground, which is that because of the low barriers to entry, anyone can actually compete at any time and get in and create the better mousetrap. DuckDuckGo has ads everywhere. I saw them all over the Minnesota airport the other day. They have a robust competition going on with Google. So that's the big differential between 2020 and 1890. So I forgot to award uh, Jessica your two points for creative destruction and Shumter in your last answer. So that's two to two. Somebody doesn't have a score on the board yet, but here's your last opportunity. And I'm going to give two points to this question. Also comes from anonymous, could be a different anonymous because they mention a soccer analogy. And after spending 18 years of my life on the soccer sidelines. I've come to love uh, this sport, at least as played by, by girls and women. Uh, here's the question. Big tech is largely ad supported. So the biggest victims are traditional media who have been amplifying the tech lash. Europe was mentioned earlier. They also are victims of the US tech success. Could using antitrust law here be the biggest own goal in US economic history turning the future over to Europe and China. Who wants, in fact, why don't you all three take a, a crack at that and then on your way out, uh, tell us uh, how to best find out more information about you and what your work is on antitrust. And uh, let's go to uh, Chris first. Yes, I do think this could be a, a huge own goal. I, I don't think that we give enough uh, credit to these tech companies for better or for worse for the role they do in exporting American principles abroad. Um, you think of the way that, the, that these companies have, um, have, have really done uh, a good job of presenting, um, presenting American ideals abroad. It's, it, 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 to, to kneecap that will definitely be giving um, you know, a global edge to, uh, to countries like China. Uh, and, and even Europe, for example, um, you know, because now their uh, cumbersome regulatory apparatus has become our cumbersome regulatory apparatus, and they don't have to suffer the, uh, the cost of being bad at regulating, right? Um, because we're all bad at it now. Um, I, <clears throat> so I, I would say that, and, and I would say you can find more about the work that we do at the, the CGO.org. Um, we've got a lot of tech polling um, on this. And then in one final point, it, it got brought up in the chat, but I think it is worth mentioning. Um, and that's the flip side of breaking up these companies is uh, classifying them as utilities. And, and I think that you're seeing this, but you know, the, the Republican attorney general of Ohio, for example, has a lawsuit trying to declare uh, Google a, a utility. Um, and I, I think we just we, we have to keep in mind the reality of the situation about this time last year, Twitter was using, losing, losing with an L, losing so many monthly users that it just stopped reporting it. They no longer report their, their monthly users because it was such, uh, you know, you were seeing double digit stuff, price in their stock drop every time they announced all of the users that have left. So the market will correct 
right? It may not correct as fast as you wish it would, but the market will correct and using um, the government to, to achieve what you think the market otherwise could almost assuredly guarantees that the market will never achieve that thing. Um, and that's, I'll leave it there. And, and, and thank you, uh, IPI and Bartlett for, for having me. Thank you for being here. I, I personally appreciate it and IPI does as well. Carl, let's give Jessica the last word because again, she looks most professorial. Um, and uh, same question over to you about these, uh, the rent seeking behavior of perhaps of traditional media and uh, Europe, so to speak, uh, rent seeking, I guess, by Europe um, in a way. And then how do we find out more about uh, net choice? And you're on mute. First of all, to close the loop, uh, nationalization, I think, is rarely the solution. And if you want innovation at the speed of government, that's what you'll get. Uh, but yeah, I, I really do worry about us uh, uh, shanking our innovation and essentially um, giving a free kick to our, our competitors. And that seems to be what we're doing right now. Every, we lead the world. If you're winning a race, do you just sit on the sidelines? And these are the types of lessons that Aesop's taught us with the tortoise and the hare. And what happens to the hare when he sits and stops giving up his, his natural born advantage? He loses. And we are being chased by a slow tortoise. And if we stop and, and end up just taking a time out and sit on the bench, we're gonna lose the race. So, this is an international issue. This is a national issue. And we really need to, either whether you're a conservative, Democrat, as Americans, need to see the forest for the trees. And if we want to put corporations ahead of competitors and think those are good democratic values, go ahead and do it. If you want to put corporations ahead of competitors and think that's good for voters in rural districts and Republican districts, go ahead and do it. But if you're going to do these actions, do it eyes wide open and recognize that you are threatening your constituents and America's competitiveness on a global scale. You can find out more information at netchoice, N-E-T-C-H-O-I-C-E dot org. And you can follow me, like, follow and subscribe at Carl Zabo. And Carl, two points for you for ancient Greek reference Aesop's fables. Thank you very much. Jessica, uh, why don't you bring us home uh, your answer on this question, and then how do we find out more about you and your work? So on the uh, traditional media front, I think uh, you only need look at the Murdoch's red, hot, burning hatred for tech companies um, and, and the, the traditional media outlets they own and, and their opinion on them to kind of connect the dots there. I'll just suggest that everyone give that some thought. Uh, in terms of international, I think that's exactly right. Listen, one of the feathers in our cap in the US is this tech sector and it's no coincidence, right? It's a product of um, our regulatory environment amongst many other things. And to change that means to make ourselves vulnerable to look a lot more like Europe, which as we all know is super fun to visit but nobody wants to be regulated there. So let's just keep that in mind. Um, I, oh, and I wanted to jump in on the, um, should we regulate social media as um, common carriers? No. Or utilities? No. Who's happy with their utility? It's crazy. Don't do that. It's a poor fit and it never works. It's never worked. Don't do it. Uh, CEI.org. And thank you so much for having me. It's been so much fun and I'm very lucky to be here with Chris and Carl. So thank you guys too. So Jessica gets a further two points for pithiest of answers. So Jessica wins by a shot on goal. Thank you very much to all three of you. Truly appreciate you. Uh, yep, sorry, Chris, I saw your uh, scowl. You have lost, so that's all right. Um, happens to all of us. Uh, Tom, sorry, speaking of losing out, Tom, sorry, did not able, we're not able to get you in here. Great questions and great panelists who kept me at least endlessly enthralled. And uh, I'm walking away understanding a lot more about antitrust from these different angles. So Tom, let me send it over to you. Yeah, I've got a chip on my shoulder because I had about six good questions that we didn't have time to get to, but I want to thank Jessica in particular for raising the common carrier issue at the very end, because, you know, if there's any, if there's any common denominator for common carriers, it's that space in which there is no innovation, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying, Tom. If you were going exactly. to try to come up with a definition of common carriers, it is that realm in which there is no innovation. And so I, we should not be looking to expand 
the reach of common carriers. If anything, we should be looking to narrow it. I just want to thank Bartlett again for putting this together. I want to thank Carl and Chris and Jessica for joining us today. I think the content has been excellent. I hope that our participants have enjoyed it. As I said earlier, this video will be recorded and archived on our website. So you'll be able to share this with, uh, with folks that you think would be interested during the pandemic. We've now done, I think, about 36 or 37 of these Zoom uh, policy discussions. They're all archived on IPI's website or on our YouTube channel. So uh, we want to appreciate the innovation of Zoom and video conferencing for allowing us to continue to reach our audience uh, despite the, uh, the uh, challenge of a global pandemic. And with that, uh, I will thank everyone one last time, and I will uh, encourage our audience to enjoy the rest of their afternoon and to stay plugged in with IPI. We have future events scheduled. You'll be on the list. So we appreciate you joining us so much. And with that, I'll thank everyone and say have a great afternoon.